Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to uh, What's Hot in Singapore this week. And uh, we have Mike Ong with us. Hello. How are you, Mike? Oh, so far, doing fine. All right, great. Uh, welcome, everybody. If you can hear us, can you just type yes on the comment so that we know that you are able to hear and see us well? Hello. Have you had your dinner, Mike? <laughs> Yeah, just have a bit of a dinner. Later, I'll continue. Oh, continue some more. Yes, correct. So, how about you? I think yeah, they can able to hear. Yeah, I just had also lah. Thanks, Eileen. Yeah, thanks. Okay, it looks like we are all set to go. So, um, welcome once again to uh, what's on in Singapore. Tuesday, we have uh, Mike on with us from uh, Philip Securities. Uh, Earlier uh, last month, actually, we have him on board as well to give us a an outlook on the market, right? And um, yes, this week, this week he's gonna update us on what's what's hot and what's happening in Singapore, uh, and therefore he's gonna basically share with us uh, the happenings in Singapore, lah. So maybe Mike, um, uh, before we start, let me just uh, share the slides, yeah. Okay, sure. Thank you, uh, Ong Sing. Okay, so before we start, or whatever that is being shared here today is for educational purposes only. It's not intended as any investment advice. So if you want to look for an investment advice, please do look for a licensed and professional investment advisor. All right. Um, so I'm going to pass this to Mike. He's going to give us some update. And if you have any questions for him, you can just type the, the questions on the comment. Um, and then we will bring those questions up. Uh, whenever it's needed. Lah. All right, uh, it's okay for us uh, to interrupt you on, on your presentation, Mike, if there is any urgent question yeah. to be addressed. Okay, sure. All right, thank you, Mike. So um, over to you, Mike. So anything anything exciting uh, happening in Singapore? Actually, I will say that this webinar was actually prepared in with the intention of Singapore, uh, Singapore being opened up in the recovery pay. Uh, However, in just one week, because we actually prepared this webinar last week, then in just one week, right, actually quite a lot of things happened in Singapore. You can see the number of COVID cases, so I should up, spike up a lot. Yeah, so I will say that in this uh, so-called what is hot in Singapore, it does affect this uh, webinars also. So it's also <laughs> a bit hard for us to change the entire content. So this content is what we will be actually focusing is the recovery play of Singapore. Because when the economy starts to recover, right, you can know that some of this existing sector and economy are affected. So when you actually start to recover, there'll be actually a lot of opportunities. However, I will say that with the current situation in Singapore and worldwide, this opportunity may actually put on hold for maybe a delay for another few more weeks or even up to a few more months. Right. Yeah. But what's, so uh, maybe what's Singapore? Yeah, what's Singapore stand right now? I mean, um, in Malaysia, right? We are, we are. I mean, I think they are planning now for us to go into an endemic stage, right? Which is basically living with the virus, because our numbers has not come down as well. It has been around twenty k, so uh, I don't think so. The numbers will come down in the short term, and you know, businesses are suffering at the moment, now, right? So, so what's what yes. Singapore? Are they still going to do the lockdown? Are they are they planning into an endemic situation? Uh, actually, they plan to do this, but. Actually, they also didn't expect the situation to escalate so fast because when we start to open the economy recently, the case showed up uh, from 100 plus, dropped down to around less than 100. But in over these just a few days, right, it showed up today, it's around 300 plus. So actually, mm. they're also talking about the current vaccination, right? Is it really sufficient to stop some of these uh, mutated variants like Delta, all this hmm. and even further on there's even further mutation ongoing yeah so in that case uh, our government say that is they are now in a tough spot they want to actually open up but end up all this situation will continue to affect uh the overall situation that's why it won't be uh, actually a very easy straight away recovery period we'll expect further going forward right there'll be a lot of un recovery period going forward right Right, so same situation, I think, worldwide, like, including here in Malaysia. <laughs> yes, yes, I think uh, everyone was thought, hey, uh, going to recover. They see their case actually like, drop down. Even UK and US, right, they have actually quite high vaccination rate. Singapore has one of the highest vaccination rate in the world. But we see that this one, with the mutation coming from uh, those countries that actually 
uh, don't actually get well vaccinated, right? The mutation continue to happen, and in this case, they can actually re occur and spread back to uh, country that are well vaccinated. Yeah, so this one will be a, I'll say that it's a long term serious issue. It's not like vaccination we straight away expect everyone to actually not be affected, but now we have to live with that uh, and continue with our yeah. measure. Yeah, I don't know what kind of variant will be coming up after this as well, right? At the time, uh, you just want yeah. to go down and then suddenly the new one comes in and then it just spiked up again. Yes, correct. Uh, because you can see so many <laughs> mutations along the way. Uh. This one is actually quite a yeah. serious issue. I don't think and this happened in the whole world before. <laughs> yeah. yeah, That's why it's quite hard for uh, uh, government to handle and especially with the globalization, right? Because last time, maybe all this pandemic is not so easy because there's no so-called, uh, how to say it, fast shipping and also uh, airline transportation. But with this, all this uh, globalization, right? Actually, all this shipping industry, right? They actually get uh, good well. And they, but this one actually also enable the virus to spread easily. That's why it's harder to control. So you just take an example. We talk about SARS in 20, I think it's 2003, around that period. At that point of time, why actually it didn't really escalate that worse, right? It's partly because it's uh, in China. And China, at that point of time, right, is actually not connected to the world. They only just joined the w, uh, World Trade Organization only over that period of time. That's why you can see, actually, uh, in that case, it, it's not really uh, well uh, going to spread. But however, you can see with subsequently, we have this what, H1N1, and also we have the this COVID, you can see because of the globalization throughout the whole world, the virus actually become a easy spread through all these uh, means of shipping and also the airline, uh, right. how to say, delivery of our good services. Yeah. That's why this one will yeah. continue to cause uh, uncertainty in our market everywhere. Mm. Okay. Uh, that, that being said, I mean, the US market is still climbing quite high right now and uh, Singapore is still holding on quite well. And that's why we're going to get update from you. Lah. Yes, got it. Okay, so uh, yeah, I'll share my slide first. Okay, sure. Okay, yes, today. So you have uh, any questions? Sorry, sorry. If you have any questions, guys, just type in the questions down there, right? So we can uh, post those questions later on. Yeah, sorry, Mike. Yes, got it. Okay, uh, this is the disclaimer. I think just now you also mentioned about disclaimer. So you need to actually, so, because when you talk about all this investment, right? Because let's say if your investment horizon or even your investment objectives is different, right? Then sometimes you may not fit. So it's better to get a uh, proper advisory. So you can see that, let's say a person only want to invest for maybe next one to two years. However, some investment pay, right? They may take up to five to 10 years. Like for example, you talk about EV card will actually take around 5 to 10 years or even 15 years to develop because of the government policy pushing for the EV card. So we don't expect some investment to be a short term. So you need to actually find a financial advisory to find investment that is suitable for your uh, investment horizon and objective. Uh, so today we'll be discussing market outlook and what are the stocks to look out for recovery pay. So I'll say that uh, towards end of this year, from end of this year until uh, from now this month towards end of this year, there'll be actually quite a lot of government policy. They'll be actually debating whether to cut uh, stimulant for the economy or whether to actually continue to support. So just this month, we have actually the US, the Eurozone on the, all their monetary policy. And October, well, another thing to look out for is actually the Japan general election. So that will be actually something quite, uh, I would say that, uh, quite exciting because Japan is also one of the global leaders. Then, yeah, you can see all the towards end of the year is all surrounding all this monetary policy. I would say that uh, at first the Fed actually decided, I would say that they will be looking at a few different factors. First, they will look at inflation rate, they'll be looking at job data, and they also look at the macro economy of the situation. I would say that just last Friday, I think some of the non farm payroll. Uh, data is actually a bit of disappointing and also they are also worried that because of the rising cases of COVID in uh, US, you can see actually the case actually spike up to almost the previous high. So you can see to maybe uh, slow down their process then they will continue with uh, stimulant to help the economy because it's not a really a smooth recovery like what happened in 2008 when you can see actually towards the next few years, right? Actually, the economy actually recovered quite smoothly. 
However, with COVID, right, because this disease or uh, this uh, virus, right, continue to uh, cause damage around our economy. And you can see just last, a few months, last month, one of the China port, one of the third, uh, third world, third busiest port in China, right, have to shut down for a few weeks. And this will actually cause a lot of shipping issue because China, you remember, is the third world busiest port in China, uh, the whole world. So you can see all these ships will be being stuck there because they need to do unloading and loading. So this one can actually cause the global chain effect throughout the whole world. So you can see all this will continue to cause uh, short-term inflation because of the rising cost also. So we, another thing that we need to take note is actually the US debt ceiling. So actually, the uh, US government actually has suspended their debt ceiling uh, for the past few months because they are work, uh, uh, actually suspend their debts for the past one year, past one year to two years because of the issue of the COVID. However, now the debt ceiling actually recently expired and now the government have only uh, sufficient funds to keep their operation for the next two to three months. So this means that around sub October or uh, even November, right, you can see actually the government funds will actually run out of uh, funds to operate the whole government. And we know that what happened in 2018 when they actually there's a shutdown prolonged into 2019. Okay, so maybe just talk about the US debt ceiling. So they actually missed their debt ceiling in end of July. So why is this so important? Because the government can only keep operation, just so you mentioned, only up to two to three months. And yeah, you can see uh, in 2018, one day and two zero one nine when the government US government shut down, you can see how much the market actually dropped. So during that period, I can see I think the S and P dropped at least around thirty to forty percent during that period of time. So you can see for the US right during that period of time, they actually the whole government shutdown actually caused the overall economy eleven eleven billion of loss. Although they actually some of the loss actually recover when the economy open up, but there's actually a permanent loss of three billion because some people will be out of job. Uh, so called they do not have uh, income during that period of time. So in that case, they may not lower down their spending or this. So all these have actually uh chain effect throughout the whole US. And US is being the leading government of the whole world currently. This is not number one. So in case that's US gov uh shut now, this one will also indirect effect uh, throughout the whole world also. So you can see this, the potential effect of this government shutdown. So this is something that uh, most of us will keep a, a very closely look out for. So yeah, we, this one you can see actually uh, during that period of time, right, every day you can see actually the stock market right, can drop two to 3%. So imagine that uh, how much if you're investing, that, that that's something that you'll be worried because you can see your investment being affected. Oops, looks like we have lost Mike. Hello? Yeah, Come I think on. I um, yeah, there's lots of connection. Yeah, yeah okay. there, was a, there was a short uh, disconnect earlier. Yeah, okay. So actually, what the, maybe everyone want to make a guess what will be the factor that drive economic growth before I show the answer. You can type your answer inside the chat. Yeah, guys, so can you just help out here? Um, what do you think are the factors that drive the economic growth? Uh, worldwide growth or just uh, Singapore, uh, Mike? Uh, economic growth is actually for any anywhere. All right. So every, uh, I'll say that the overall, right, everywhere they'll have actually the similar economic growth factors. Okay, guys, just type in the factors that you think are driving the current economic growth. Uh, we say credit. Mm. I think credit he referred to uh, money <laughs> or oh, am I right <laughs> okay yeah, maybe I'll show the answer yes maybe I'll just show the answer so actually there are actually three uh, factors I would say that money wise is actually important to build up the accumulation of capital stock means that all your machinery your uh, assets property or this Second one will be actually uh, in terms of labor input, uh, number of people working hours also. Then lastly will be the technology advancement where they help you in terms of all these productivities. So when you talk about technology advancement, right, last time maybe one person can only, uh, if it's hand operation, maybe you can only 
build up one machine, uh, one product at one time. However, when they actually they use technology advancement, all this right with a machinery, they can actually build up many different products at once. One operator can operate one machine, and this machine can maybe produce ten thousand to twenty thousand of this product at one time. So these are the three factors that actually drive all this economic growth. They had an input to this because we need, uh, first of all, we need machinery. We need uh, all this uh property. We need uh infrastructure. After that, we need all this human. Human is one of the most uh, critical portion. Lastly, the advancement. Like all this using of this technology to further improve on all these productivities. So next thing is that uh, we need to actually look at the worldwide uh, daily cases of this COVID situation. So you can see actually recently with uh, around July, actually the number of COVID cases throughout the whole world has been spiking up. Uh, so this one is actually a co will continue to cause a serious concern for all these government because when the actually COVID continue to actually cause damage, right? Sometimes there'll be unexpected shutdown or sometimes they, uh, there'll be unexpected uh, uh, measures to actually stop all this spreading of this COVID situation. And especially with F&B industry, it will be actually one of the industry that will be uh, affected most because we can't dine in over there. So you can see different industry will be affected differently. So we will see that actually this is looking like also uh, what we call, uh, if you look in TA, what you call is actually uh, head and shoulder. So we hope this become the next shoulder and subsequently go all the way down because uh, head and shoulder is actually a very important trend for TA where it show a reversal trend. So we will need to see whether this one really play out as head and shoulder and not become another higher peak. I think it's something that we hope to see. <laughs> if not, this will really cause a lot of issue to the global economy. So actually, we also look at uh, actually all these uh, manufacturing uh, purchase manufacturing index. So you can see actually the uh, just this one is actually taking from the JP Morgan Global Manufacturing PMI. So you can see actually during this period, actually last year, right, when you see there's actually a global shutdown, the PMI is straight or really uh, dropped significantly because all these, all the factory, all the production, all these they actually stop operation. Subsequently, even though the case actually this spike up, right, the government actually try not to lock down the whole economy anymore because this one can really cause a lot of business to go bankrupt. And when they go bankrupt indirectly, they affect the bank and affect those people who are holding the are working, having the income and the job. So all these have very serious impact. So you can see in a recent few months, right, this uh, PMI has start to actually show a bit of a uh, drop down and slow down again because it's actually you can see the COVID cases suddenly actually start to rise. There's actually some restriction break in place. So you can see actually they also do uh, so-called uh, spread out into good different sectors like consumer, intermediary and so although there's actually a uh, so-called uh, upturn in the global manufacturing sector but it's actually start to lose momentum. And out of this uh, in August, right, you mentioned that out of this 31 uh, nation, right, uh, 31 is actually still maintaining above uh, the uh, neutral mark of 50. Then except for the last 10, they're actually facing a bit of contraction. So just now we also mentioned that why China actually is doing well, but end up when the actually that support shut down, right, end up you also can affect all this because uh, factory need raw material. So if the ship, uh, all this ship, uh port right is being locked down right then raw material may not be able to get to the factory and the factory they want to deliver goods out of the factory to the port and to the rest of the world all this will actually cause significant impact so another thing that you also notice right some of these are uh, nation on the higher side right you can see they tend to have actually higher vaccination rate and those countries with lower vaccination rate right you can see actually they have actually a, a, a manufacturing uh, pmi contraction so you can see actually this one is uh, closely related to the vaccination rate also. So you can see some of these country, right, they tend to have actually lower vaccination rate. Uh, for China wise, it's a bit unique because of the port shutdown. Because I'll say that China, as compared to the rest of the world, right, they are actually very uh, strict in their control. As long as a few cases of COVID, right, you'll, they actually will go all the way to lock down even the city or even the port. They won't actually allow them to spread. 
uh, like rest of the world, they are very strict in all this control. But for the rest of the world, if it's uh, just a few cases, sometimes they'll just uh, continue as normal until the case reach a, a certain level of worry, like a few hundred or even a few thousand, then they'll start to actually take action. So you can see this kind of uh, mentality wise, right, they also do affect the economy. So we also, when you're investing, investing, right, something we need to think of is actually the vaccination rate of the uh, population. If the higher the population is vaccinated, right, then the recovery of this economy will be more stable. If those that are not well vaccinated with a low vaccination rate, yeah, this one will continue to actually cause impact in terms of this restriction. And also the mutation also continues. So now we can know that uh, some of these vaccination, they may not be totally effective against the Delta virus. So I think you can start to see all this uh, actually happen in the news. People who actually got vaccination, right, they continue to catch the virus also. Uh, this is something that you need to think also. Yeah, so we talk about US, UK. So you can see all these countries tend to have actually high PMI, tend to have actually higher vaccination rate. As compared to those that have actually low vaccination rate, lower PMI because of the lockdown and the restriction measure in place. So in Singapore, we actually, uh, I would say that our government target actually hit the target of 80% and also at least 83% uh, of the people actually receive uh, one dosage. So one thing is that uh, when we actually prepare this data well, last week, we are looking at, well, this one will actually help uh, the recovery period of the economy. So you actually know that recently we also launched a uh, so-called uh, travel services. I travel to actually Germany, we have uh, so-called some uh, negotiation with them and the uh, visitor can come over here, we can go to Germany. So in that case, you can see with country who have actually well vaccinated, right, this will also start to open up. So what to look out when actually the economy start to open up? I would say that Singapore, with the recent uh, one week plus of cases spiking out, right, the economy uh, opening up may take longer. So actually, maybe you all want to share what uh, industry will you look out when the economy start to really fully open before I say start to share my thoughts. Whether is it uh, f &B or whether is it uh, industry, so what sector do you expect to actually uh, look out for? Because you know that actually in different business cycle, right, you know that actually different sector will perform differently. For example, actually, uh, when sector in during recession, right, actually healthcare is one of the sector that will tend to actually perform well, uh, it, regardless is it COVID or not, because healthcare is tend to be defensive. When regardless, let's say if you really fought ill on the, uh, during the recession, no matter where you have to get treatment, that's why it tend to be more uh, defensive as compared to other stocks. Like for example, those growth stock during recession, right? In that case, they would tend to underperform on the whole economy. So anyone want to guess uh, what sector will tend to do well? Okay, anyone want to guess? I guess it would be retail, right? I think... Uh, uh, yes, retail is... Actually, retail, I would say that f and also fall under retail, yes. Retail will actually tend to do better. Yeah, anyone want to try? I guess because a lot of people also is like, um, you know, they have this uh, revenge spending. Yeah, so Lauren said consumer, consumer. Yes, consumer staple. Mm. Yeah, I think, uh, yes, consumer, all this. Yeah, so actually, what we will be talking about some of these two stocks that will actually related to consumer tourism. Yes, but tourism, I won't be talking about this because I would say that tourism and hospitality will tend to be very uneven recovery because of this. Uh, I would say that consumer will be the first one to open because internally the country they open up, but for the hospitality right tourism right, it may take longer because there will be still measure for you. Let's say if you want to travel overseas, when you come back you get caught COVID. In that case, sometimes I think the government may not be going to subsidize all this treatment. So in that case, people will be still a bit hesitant to travel because, well, the medical expenses of the treatment. Let's say you need in a uh, emergency work of all this IC, right? I think in Singapore can be cost up to a thousand per day. So you can imagine the serious impact of this. So that's why this one will be a deter deterrence or may cause people to actually think twice when they want to travel overseas. So actually I will say that 
today the first stock I'll be talking about is actually Thai Beverage. Uh, I think everyone heard about this before. Okay, so uh, I'll say that the most famous one is actually all this beer and liquor. So actually what Thai Beverage is actually aiming to do is actually aim to be the stable and sustainable Asian leader in all these beverages and food business. So that's why they actually they have uh, four different classes of their business. First one will be the spirit, second one will be the beer, third one will be the non-alcoholic beverages, and third, fourth will be the uh, food. So you can actually see the revenue breakdown of this company in 2020. So you can see actually and the beers current, <coughs> currently are still make up a very significant portion of their total revenue. However, for the uh, non-beverages and food, right, yeah, make up a very sin a small portion. So they actually also intend to actually grow this to, to help in the business also, to make it more diversified. So this is last year, and maybe we also want to take a look because it recently just announced their results. So we want to compare whether they're actually really doing that well or they're actually significantly affected because, you know, all this pub and bar and all this F&B, right, is being shut down. And also in Thailand, uh, right, you can see actually a lot of measures still in place. Although Thailand, I would say that they are looking up to open their economy, uh, tourism right in the next few months or so. So actually from the recent result, right, why we did a comparison. Eh, okay, this one we talk about the business contribution, then we'll talk about the recent result. So you can see, we also see that actually for uh, Thailand, right, their main business is actually coming from Thailand and Vietnam. So you can see this portion, right, they make up a very significant portion of their overall revenue. Then the rest of the world make up a very small portion. So you can see how Thailand actually recover and also opening up the Thailand, right, will actually help in the revenue of these uh, Thai beverages. And you can see uh, for this, right, just now we see uh, Spirit is actually one of the largest contribution followed by, by the beer. So next thing is that because of this conversation, you want to see what is the impact. So that's why we see uh, what happened in uh, two zero. Uh, uh, they have the uh, three quarter result from two zero two one and two zero two zero. So you can see actually in the overall right, the overall sales right, despite all this uh, government restriction and measure and lockdown right, actually the sales revenue still increased by one point one percent. So you can see the uh, main business right, in terms of all this spirit and beer right, they actually continue to grow stronger as compared to the previous year. However. You can see actually there's uh, some drop in the uh, actually non-beverages and also the food. So this is actually quite an interesting trend because we expect with all this lockdown of this uh, FMB and also pub industry, the spirit and beer will be significantly affected. However, in from the status, uh, sales of the revenue, actually they continue to be strong because of the house consumption. I would say that it's also quite unique that beer industry is continue to grow on the, if you look on a long-term trend right beer industry actually continue to grow on a long-term basis so there's something uh, unique about this stock also so next thing is let's say if the government actually start to open up with the tourism pay what will the sales of this period and the beer pay would they start to increase further also so this is something that we need to keep a lookout for so we can expect the outlook for this type of beverage will remain to be stable and may even outperform the economy actually start to open so one thing is that first of all we look at the balance sheet whether because the sales right we also need to look whether they are uh, they are still healthy or not let's say if they take longer to recover then in that case whether they actually uh, have sufficient funds to keep operation so one of the normally you just see this current asset all this actually just tell you the number so sometimes you need to make use of all this what we call financial ratio so it's, I would say that I will introduce two simple financial ratios to look at the depth level of the company. First one we'll be talking about is actually current ratio is actually taking the current asset divided by the current liability. So we want to see whether there's any deterioration uh, in the overall. So you can see in uh, just uh, the current ratio right uh, in 1.051 and also 1.026. So actually there's actually not really a very significant deterioration. They still remain healthy. That's even the debt ratio, there's actually not much of a change. So you can see actually for the whole Thailand bank, uh, balance sheet, it actually still remain healthy. And also you want to look at the cash flow of this company. The cash flow from operator is actually positive. So why we actually want to look at cash flow? Because there's a few ways that a company can get cash flow. 
first one <coughs> will be in terms of operation. The second will be in terms of uh, investing or the third one will be actually financing. So operation actually come, the main cash flow is the revenue of this company. So in that case, cash flow for operation is something that you always need to keep a lookout for because if the cash flow is healthy, right, then this will actually keep the company operate, operating. So you can see in terms of their total cash and the cash and the financial institute, right, uh, from the start of the period to the end of the period, actually continue to grow. So it means that they're actually still growing healthily. So next thing is, we also want to look out for what are the catalysts that actually this company can look out for. So first catalyst, I would say that is actually lifting of all this COVID restriction in Singapore, Vietnam, and Thailand. I would say the main one is actually in Vietnam and Thailand. So you can see currently uh, their government in Thailand, right? They are actually slowly lifting out some, some of this restriction. They are even looking up to open their economy to the tourism because Thailand is actually very quite heavily depending on tourism. So in that case, they cannot actually hold on too long also. If not a lot, you know that if you look online, a lot of videos, right? If you go to Thailand, you go to all these uh, night market, I think there's a lot. Uh, there's some night market at the real train way and also those Rachada, all this night market, right? You see all of them actually, uh, the whole thing has been shut down. So you can see a lot of people actually lose their job during this uh, COVID uh, restriction period. So in that case, yeah, the government actually have to step in to maintain this balance opening up the economy and maintain the COVID situation also. If not, more people will be, life food will be actually being affected. And also with the lifting of all these COVID uh, restriction, right, there's also another catalyst because we actually heard about Thailand, uh, Thai beverage actually did want to actually do the list IPO of their brewery unit on the SJ. However, this one they actually put on hold because of this COVID situation. So in that case, if actually the government decide uh, to actually lift all this COVID measure and also we can see the recovery period of the overall uh, Thai beverage, right? we will expect them to do this IPO. So these will be the two catalysts to actually help the Thai beverage. I would say that this one may not be a short term, maybe it may not be a one to two, two month pay, it may even take a, up to a few quarter for this investment to pay up. So I also get uh, from the SG investor, right, because of this website, it's a quite a useful website where they actually consolidate all the analyst report and also the analyst target price. So you can see some of these analyst target price, what is it like? So one thing is that when you look at all these price, right, you also may want to think of the date. So you can see DBS and RHB, right, their date, right, tend to be a bit uh, far. So only uh, looking at the past two to three months, right, you can see actually CMIB, Main Banking, Main OCBC, Philip Security, and UOB, right, they are actually quite positive on this. But it's actually not just, a, as I mentioned, it's not a short-term pay. You may take up to a few quarters for this to pay up because of the, all the COVID situation. So we expect time beverage to actually continue to do well in the future. You can see actually their revenue actually, even with the strict restriction measures, right, the revenue is still able to grow slightly uh, or maintain at the, their current pace. Uh. So this is one of the first stock that we'll talk about today. Second one I'll be talking about is actually Comfort Delco. I think uh, for Comfort Delco, right, they actually would aim to be a world uh, land transport operation of the choice. So actually for them, right, it's actually one of the world largest transport company uh, with a fixed size of around 40,000 bus, taxi, and rental vehicle. So a lot of people also only think that Comfort Delco is just in Singapore. Um, actually, they actually have a global uh, operation uh, beyond Singapore. They have actually Singapore, Australia, China, UK, Ireland, Vietnam, and even Malaysia. So you can see actually Comfort Delco is actually quite a big organization. So maybe we want to actually look in terms of their business contribution. So where they actually generate revenue from. So Singapore, yes, they make up around 53% of their revenue. Then for the next two biggest market will be actually Australia and UK and Ireland. These three right, actually make up a very significant portion. And also in terms of their business segment, right? So you can see actually the public transportation right services actually make up of this huge uh, pie, around 70, 77%. So in that case, you can see everyone actually uh, in all this country, right, you need public transportation. So in that case, Comfort Delco will continue to be 
relevant and stable also. So you can see actually the current business revenue. So next thing is that we want to look at their recent revenue. So how do I see it really pay out? So usually a lot of people just look at, oh, what is the profit, operating profit and loss? However, sometimes we also need to make, think know that sometimes in a certain situation, right? Like for example, recession and also this COVID situation, there's actually government relief. So in that case, without government relief, are they actually really doing healthy and better? So in that case, first one, you see the revenue for this come Revenue is always the, what we call the top line. So top line, you can see actually their revenue, right? Have a side increase. Next thing you can see, operation profit also increase. So look good. However, we also want to look a bit in depth to see actually uh, what are the revenue before all this government relief. So sometimes if you look at different company, right? Even sometimes in uh, like you talk about REITs, right? In REITs, right? Because they actually have sponsor. So sometimes the REITs actually not uh, doing that well, right? Sometimes the, the sponsor may also do a bit of help out in the REITs. So in this case, uh, this one do not have sponsor. Government will do a bit of help out to uh, all this business. So you can see over here, right? Actually, government did have some help out in the overall revenue. So even excluding this government relief, right? you can see actually uh, Comfort Delco is still doing well. They have actually improved from last year. And with the actually economy start to open, right? More people will be actually going to work and all this, right? Uh, then in that case, the revenue will, for them will also come into play because you know that the public transportation is actually one of their biggest segment. So yeah, we also want to look at their balance sheet. Okay, so balance sheet. So one thing is that we want to look at their uh, cash. Okay, so we mentioned two different current assets is actually their current asset divided by their current liability. So in actually there are much more ratio, but in today's webinar, I'll just keep it simple. In case you need, uh, I'll have actually come out with another webinar about talking about top 10 ratio that we can use uh, to analyze the company. So, but today we will just keep it to two ratio for this balance sheet. So in that case, you can see uh, in the recent month, they actually they are uh, compared to last year, in the recent half of year, right? Actually, their uh, current ratio have a uh, increase, and also their debt ratio actually decreased. So in that case, you can see for the comfort they have, their balance sheet is still remaining healthy. And also another thing is they want to look out for their uh, operation for cash flow is it really uh, doing healthy. So you can see actually they do have a uh, so called positive cash flow from the operation activities. So you can see, minusing all this, uh, because for Comfort Delco, they do have all these uh, train services and also taxi or this, right? In that case, they also have to spend all this money on the KPEX. So in that case, you can see they utilize all of this cash flow. In total, the, they still have actually a positive cash net info. So another thing is that last time company actually used to do quite a lot quarterly update and they actually spend a lot of money because every time they have to get a lot of uh, external auditor to check however now a lot of company actually shift to even a half a year or even one year right in that case all this did uh company ratio right they may not be actually fully audited it's just internal audit audited only so this is some things that we also need to keep a lookout when they actually are looking at some of these numbers so what what are some of these recent development actually comfort that we have recently have to do quite a lot uh, win quite a number of contracts. So first thing is that they have been actually awarded a 1.13 billion contract to operate one of these railway in the Auckland. It's actually their first uh, time into the New Zealand. Just want to mention Australia, UK and Singapore make up the major portion of their market. So now they're actually going to New Zealand. This will actually create a new opportun opportunity for them in the New Zealand. And if you look into this uh, Auckland, right, I would say that it's one of the busiest transportation service in New Zealand. So in that case, they actually uh, benefit and this one will actually open up further opportunity for them to operate in the New Zealand. So it's actually through a joint venture with the Comfort Delco and the UGL Railway Services. This one is a UGL services, Railway Services is a company in Australia. Okay, I think uh, there's a typo error. This one should comment in actually 16 January 2021. So in, and it actually helped them to actually continue to secure for the next 
uh, eight years and with further opportunity to do further extension means more uh, transportation services. And next thing is that we just talk about all these uh, EV cars. So even before the EV car adoption, right, a lot of people will face a lot of issue in terms of all this charging infrastructure. And charging infrastructure is not just, I want to build straight away, I can build. Because all this, right, they need require uh, may require a high electricity power supply. Right? In that case, it will take time to plan out all this infrastructure. So with ComfortDelGo, they actually want some of this contract with this, uh, the partnership with this French energy giant engine. So this right, they actually out of the Singapore, right? Because Singapore actually aim to build around 60,000 of this uh, charging infrastructure in Singapore. But for the first phase, right? They are only uh, building 632 first. Then in that case, right? Actually comfort they put one around major, I would say that almost around 70 to 80% of this uh, charging. And this will help them the uh open up opportunity for more future uh come uh all this future opportunity to build more EV, ev structure so you can see from the current uh, recent development right you actually have a lot of opportunity to further skill their business in the future also so what are the potential catalysts first one i would say that uh first thing is same lifting of this covid restriction in singapore australia and uk so with this, right, there'll be more people taking public transport. So I think currently uh, Australia is actually having a quite a strict uh, restriction at the moment because of the high COVID cases. So in this case, yeah, this one continue to affect them. And Singapore wise, we do have some manager, but people are still uh, free to go out and UK also because of our high vaccination rate. So just like I mentioned, uh, there's also another opportunity because there's also more upcoming contract in the recent months right to transportation contracts in australia however i think this one the announcing of all this winning of this contract may also delay because of all this uh, restrict, uh so-called restriction in australia so in that case the winning of this contract may announcement may delay so in case uh, comfort they'll continue to win all this contract they'll actually help them to secure more revenue and uh, opportunities going forward so you can see also another catalyst will be talking about EV infrastructure. Yeah, so they actually aim to, Singapore aim to have to actually 60,000 by 2030. So you can see actually they win around seven, around 70 to 80% of the recent award. So if they can actually win six, 60 to 70% of, of this total 60,000, right, it's around 10, uh, 100 times more. So in that case, you will open more opportunity revenue for this comfort Delco. And also same thing for this comfort they'll go right they are also looking to uh, list their ipo in australia because they are actually all this uh, train and infrastructure asset right they are actually looking to do ipo in the uh, australia however for one thing is that when company want to do ipo right, they won't want to do in a bad economic situation because they can't be able to unlock more shareholders value so in that case you actually put this on hold and wait for a better timing when actually the COVID uh, situation in Australia start to improve, right? I'll expect them to also do the IPO listing. So this will help to unlock a lot of shareholders value. So you can see actually do uh, the target price for all this comfort they'll go from all these different analysts, right? So we need to take note, the same thing we need to take note, this RHB mini, we want to exclude them. So you can see all these recent months, um, uh, some of these recent months update, right? You do have actually quite a uh, positive outlook on this uh, uh comfort they'll go so this is some of the shares that you can actually look out for so for philip rice right actually we also come up with a top 10 absolute pick uh for the three the third quarter of this so you can see actually comfort they'll go uh, is also inside and also uh type average so actually for type average and comfort they'll go they do also pay out quite attractive uh, I would say that attractive dividend around uh, this is around two percent plus and kind of comfort they quite. I would say that last year they uh, recently they did have a car. I expect them to go go back to around two top uh may go up back to around two percent plus also. So these are some of the call by our Philip analyst. So just now in case you are actually you are looking in Sing in top of Singapore store, right? I would actually really recommend you to go to SG investor website. So this is a uh, top tempe. So maybe I want to introduce to the website first thing. Okay. 
we do have some questions on ComfortDelGro. Um, Brandon, uh, Mike, you, you want to answer this? Um, Brandon is asking, okay, sure, how sure. is ComfortDelGro different mm -hmm. from MS, uh, SMRT I... yeah. and also SBS Transit? Yes, okay, I understand that. Okay, so for ComfortDelGro, right, is a public company, but SMRT, right, last time, uh, all this used to be listed and they have been actually taken into private already because they actually talk about all this uh, public transport, uh, some of these public transport services, right, they are not able to uh, generate revenue. In that case, they are making a uh, loss making. In that case, actually, they do privatization of some of these uh, companies. Uh, I think I, I can't remember the exact date for this uh, FSMRT release. Uh, they actually released quite a few years ago. Let me check for you. So in that case, yeah, they actually released from SGX in around 2016. Yeah, so last time, this is actually a public company before they actually delist. So actually, ComfortDelco wise, right, they actually focus quite a lot. Uh, they do have actually quite a lot of uh, transportation. We talk about uh, the bus services, the, they do have actually some train services and also they have actually quite a huge number of in terms of all these uh, taxi. Yeah. So you can see actually for SMRT, right, it's actually just purely into the train services and the infrastructure. So there's actually a bit of difference. So one is actually private and one is a public company and I think it's in terms of their business will be a slightly different in terms of how they do. So yeah, okay, maybe you go to this SG investor website. It's very useful for Singapore investor because let's say I want to find out any other stock. I think one of the stock today that people are talking about in Singapore is actually Hong Kong land. So we just click. Because actually Hong Kong land right, recently announced, I think around 500 billion to actually buy into their shares. So actually Hong Kong land has been trading below their book value for quite a very long, long period of time. So in that case, yeah, a lot of investors are talking about Hong Kong land and today they move up by around 12.62% because of their announcement to of the 500 million to repurchase some of the existing share for the market. So let's say I want to find out what are the analyst target price. So I just select target price. Give me a moment, it'll take a while to look. So you can see uh, not a lot of company cover Hong Kong land and yeah, you see some this analyst report is not really up, updated. So let's say I want to understand this. Okay, I can click directly on this. They actually bring me to the analyst. What is the analyst uh, basis of this stock? So this one is very useful website for all this Singapore stock. Now in case you are interested in REITs, you can also read up this. So I show, I show you Singapore REITs also. So this is one of the actually website that I also use quite frequently because of the consoli all the analyst report. I don't have to go into all different uh, so-called brokerage houses to see or uh, look out for this report, look out for that report. So in that case, yes, this one is very useful because I think now we are doing a bit of live streaming, right? The website loading tend to be a bit slower. Right. Yeah, so this, this website this. is like an aggregator really of our research website. reports. Huh? Yes, right, from all the Singapore brokerage houses. So right. you can see uh, in case you are looking for ascenders, they put you over here. Even you are looking out for maybe not just research, even sector right reports, right? They also do have market strategy and sector reports for this. It's very useful. That's why you can make use of this uh, website to look out for all these uh, SGX analyst reports. They all are consolidated auto here, you don't have to go everywhere. I think you're taking quite a while to load. Okay, in case you have any questions, I just feel free to post inside the comments so I can answer that. Now you can see actually they announced today uh, their intention of 500 million and what is the, uh, they are trading at a 59% discount and currently with around 5.2 uh, dividend yield. So it's actually one of the cheapest uh, Hong Kong land so that's why they actually come up with this basis, understand the basis. Then if you want to read more, right, they actually explain how they can actually come up with all these uh, price target. 
Mm. So it's actually quite a useful website. So uh, yeah, you can just take note of this. You just Google for sginvestor.io and you can find out this. So maybe I'll go back to the slide. Sure. Okay, so uh, I think uh, just a short introduction about Philip. So we are actually the largest uh, market share for retail investor, and we have actually a net, large network of investor center in Singapore, and also we are one of the largest CFD provider. Then in case you are interested in cash plus, right, you can actually find out all these QR codes, and we actually have a quite attractive way of trading US shares, starting from uh, 3.88 and can go as low as 1.8. It's actually a flat rate, so it's good for clients who are trading uh, regardless of the amount you are trading. So it's actually a flat rate. Then we also come up with promotion or all this refer a friend and you can actually get up to 888 cash credit. And also you get up to rewards point. So in case you actually want to uh, join us, right, you can actually scan this QR code for the account opening. So maybe uh, is there any other question? Because so far you don't see much question. Yeah, yeah. Um, there, there is one. I'm just going to bring this up uh, from Lim Lip, Lim Lip PM. Oh yeah. Asking you want to do an, uh, you know, a, a brief uh, intro on the semicon industry in SGX and its uh, prospect in the next two three years. Okay, maybe I'll talk about the worldwide uh, semicon. So you can know that uh, a lot EV cars they are facing a lot shortage in terms of this uh, semicon like the chip supply. Then not just this, you also heard about iPhone also facing uh, this issue and also adult electrical appliances are facing this issue. So you can see with the technology trend, all these data centers also require all these semicon semiconductor. Then also plus the EV cars. So you can see actually, I'll say that for semiconductor industry, even for the next few years, right, you will continue to do well. And especially if the EV car adoption continue to grow, right, this will actually further uh, drive out all these uh, semiconductor and let them continue to grow because all the technology trend will require semiconductor. That's why I believe this industry will continue to do well. And even you talk about all these uh, gaming industry with all these gaming devices, right? It also requires semiconductor industry. So you can see this, all these uh, computer chips and handful mobile, all these will require that. So in that case, there actually, uh, there's quite a number of company working in terms of uh, this semiconductor industry in Singapore. We actually have AEM, we have UMS, and even have some smaller ones company. So in that case, they will say that they are, expect them to continue to benefit from all this, uh, the trend demand for all this semiconductor industry. Even China, right? Because uh, you know that actually the trade war tension between US and China and they actually did target Huawei and also did target some of these. Like in that case, China, some of these China companies, they are facing all this uh, shortage and the semiconductor industry. And their government stand is actually to focus on the next five years spent. Semiconductor industry is one of their top focus. In Singapore, wise, yes, it's also one of our focus because of the demand for this. And I would expect demand to continue to grow, with, especially with the technology trend. So in that case, you can keep a lookout for some of these stocks uh, like AEM, HYP, HYP already delisted, UMS. So you can actually go to the SG Investor website when they can actually give you the, uh, analyst will give them the price target and uh, why they actually this is or why they come out with this. Okay. Uh, in fact, I think you did mention in our last webinar about some of the semicon uh, companies as well. So. Uh, yes, guys, right. you can check out the previous uh, recording uh, where Mike also shared so you can uh, have some more idea on the semicon industry. Uh, in our yeah. next um, What's Out in Singapore, we're also going to focus on semicon, right? So, um, oh, interesting. Yeah, so we're going to take a look at, uh, we have another guest. So uh, just bear with us. Uh, we bring that uh, person up next month to talk about the semicon industry. Okay, another question here uh, from Kiev Chong. Any thoughts on Singtel uh, and the 5G development in Singapore? Will Will Singtel benefit from the 5G development? Okay, I will say that Singtel-wise, the price is uh, actually quite depressing. You can see, see actually the Singtel price, right? Uh, since the introduction of the fourth Telco and also the a lot smaller company, what you call MMVO, right? They are mobile, uh, virtual mobile operators, right? 
this one actually affect all this telco competition. Their revenue from all these sales of their mobile and the contract has been actually dropping. So in that case, yes, this one do affect them. So in that case, right, uh, yeah, Singtel has, prospect hasn't been that well until recently. You can see, uh, recently we can see what the some of the development in in overseas associate in India. So in that case, yes, Singtel is also looking to sell some of their existing asset and focus more on uh, providing services because if you are holding asset right, there will be actually high capex cost and you will need also a lot of maintenance work. That case right, they will continue to affect this. However, for if you are just focusing on purely providing services right, in that case, yeah, you can actually scale out your business easily and don't have to worry about all this uh, capex uh, cost. Then this will actually look better in terms of their rep, uh, balance sheet, revenue and balance sheet. And another thing you just want to mention, 5G development. Yes, I would say that Singtel will, is one of the benefit to benefit from 5G development. However, I would say that short term wise, I still can't really see uh, uh, the development in this 5G. But long term wise, yes, because of the technology trend, the amount of data required right, will actually require very fast network. So in that case, the current network may not be able to, to benefit. However, short term wise, Singtel may not benefit directly because they will take time for all this to develop. That's why I would say that if you're looking for Singtel, right, you look out for their, I would say that uh, their two catalysts is sales of their assets. So they can actually focus more of their revenue uh, providing services. And second thing is the technology trend. So if the technology adoption continue to grow very at a rapid rate, then 5G technology will start to come in. I would say that 5G is still pretty much in the uh, early stage yet, uh, not really uh, going to be a main focus. I would say that Singtel focus will be actually main, mainly from other than the sales of the asset is actually overseas. Whether is it in Australia or is it in uh, India, right? How actually their investment going to play out, even in Thailand? Because I think recent, uh, in the recent months, they actually, uh, there's a company, they have some stake in the, another company and another shareholder actually do want to buy out. So in that case, I'm not sure what is the single stand on that. They actually intend to keep this because it's actually offered them an opportunity to continue to do well. So they are also doing the whole company restructuring of their focus. Yeah, so this is actually some of the changes that are happening in Singtel currently. So if all these actually do play out, yeah, these are the catalysts for Singtel to do well. I think quite a lot of analysts do have a high range of target price for Singtel towards the high, higher end of the $2.2 to $3 also. Mm. But short term, yeah, they'll take time to do all these sales of assets. And also the focus into overseas. Yeah, so I guess in a, this is a little bit more a longer term play, like <laughs> instead of uh, looking at short term movements. Yes, right. Right. Um, okay, there's a question here from Terence asking, what are the if you have any idea on the charges for Hong Kong trades? Uh? Okay, uh, for cash plus, right, uh, the lowest commission is go as low as zero point zero five. So one thing is that for cash plus, you also depend on how much asset value you put inside the account. So if you put uh, more assets inside, you tend to enjoy lower rate. So the lowest rate is actually 0 0.05. However, I do think though that Hong Kong, despite this uh, commission rate, Hong Kong, uh, I would say that it's one of the most expensive market to trade in because uh, Hong Kong exchange have, do have uh, their, uh, quite a lot of exchange fee, different small exchange fee. So in that case, yes, Hong Kong tend to be one of the most expensive market to trade in. They have a lot of occurrence fee, then different small exchange fee. Yeah, so this is something that you need to look up, take a look up for. So later, if you want, right, you can go to the cash plus account, your ex, uh, look out for all these minor fee. I can't remember because it's a lot different decimal base. Yeah, Hong Kong will be one of the most expensive market. All right. Um, okay, KF Chong is asking, and uh, he noticed that DBS seems to do better than UOB and OCBC. Any particular reason? Actually, I would say that if you know DBS, right, they actually they won quite a lot uh, number of uh innovative uh top banks in a uh, technology bank in the whole world it's not just in singapore so actually dbs has been very 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 aggressive they actually uh do a lot hire a lot uh and uh, it staff and engineers right to do all this uh in terms of all these services so they are actually more like a technology company 
uh, than a bank really they are more focusing becoming a fintech so you actually know that fintech is doing very well so DBA is one of the leader in all this innovation in Singapore and also they do not have just operation in Singapore they have operation in Indonesia and recently they actually got into operation in India so that's something that I also want to worry about in India because yes they do have operation but uh for that bank they actually do take over right they do have some uh, debt issue but i believe that with the capability of this dbs they should be able to handle that uh. right so i would say that dbs is tend to be more aggressive in expanding and also in more innovative so they actually come up with a lot of new products also that's why they are tend to be doing well okay uh, okay, one more question here. Terence is asking, um, what what will be, how, how is the prospect for uh, Silver Lake? Okay, Silver Lake is actually uh, I'll say that I think Malaysia will know very well. It's actually a technology company in Malaysia, and they actually do provide a lot, of uh, banking services, uh, for all the major banks in actually the Southeast Asia, because they are the back end, uh, services. Uh, I can't tell say the bank or this, but a lot of banks. Even some of the banks I mentioned are using their services. That is something very unique. So they will continue to have uh, recurring income from all these company. Next thing is that they also have been winning a lot number of contracts uh, from all these fintech company. Recently, I think they just announced all this because you know that uh, in our previous webinar, we talked about all these fintech will continue to do well, especially with all these digital bank and for Silver League, if they are con able to continue to win all this uh, contract from all these uh, fintech companies, right, they are expecting to also do well. Because not just when they actually do uh, get into a contract, right, they also have every year subsequently, they also have um, to help them to do maintenance of their services. So this will actually help them to generate also recurring income when the company continue to do their services. Just like for example, uh, when you're talking about using uh mobile phone i don't think you want to actually switch from signing from iphone to android or android to iphone because all your data all your apps is there so it's same thing it's quite similar for a bank they do, usually don't actually do switching of, of services unless there's really serious issue so in that case they can actually if the civil is able to do skill up and continue to do get more business right they'll i believe they'll do well so one thing is that uh maybe in a a few years back right silver league do have some unpleasant uh situation where they do have the shareholders i think that some of the shareholders they do have company and sell internet to silver league so there's a bit of conflicts also so that's why silver league in the past actually used to be doing well but this one actually affected silver league position also right. although going forward i think will do well and also one thing is that Chivalry actually quite a lot of operation is also in Malaysia with the lockdown and restriction, right? This will also uh, somehow affect a bit of their operation. So I believe when Malaysia start to actually open up, right, when people start to work as usual, right, this one will to help them also. All right. Okay. Thank you so much, guys, for your questions. Um, yeah. We, before we before we end this session, let me make a few announcements before before we 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 end the session yeah um so as you guys know we actually have this uh, group called sgx campus we actually rename et online campus to um, sgx campus uh because we're going to relaunch this whole thing we're going to provide more information and more um uh ideas uh onto this uh, campus uh, i hope that uh, mike will be able to also join this and provide some information in this group of people that we have um, one of the things that we're going to do in the next one year is to actually have a xgx learn and win campaign uh, where there will be uh, weekly prizes uh, cash prizes to be won uh, and uh, you just have to answer a few questions on the quiz on sgx campus uh, group um, so you, you know just just join the group first and i uh, just make sure that your notification is on because when the questions come up uh, the first three who get the answers correct uh, will win the prizes all right so uh, we're gonna only start this at the end of this month so just you know since you guys are already here you can just join the et online campus uh, it's now just sgx campus right and you want to get update on the singapore market uh, on a regular basis you can also join sgx invest on telegram so you have telegram you just search for sgx invest 
uh, and then you can just join the group to get to get um, really regular updates of what's happening in Singapore. All right. Now another thing that we have also done um, is we actually have this website called oh. sjax dot um, It's still in a development stage, but it's free for all. You just have to go to sjax dot uh, Currently, we have some technical ideas. Uh, and at, at the end of the month, on the 28th of uh, September, I'm going to run a, a webinar on how you could use this website. All right. So at the moment, you can just browse this website and see what's, what we have in there. Um, and then um, we also have a charting tool. So even look at charts for uh, Singapore uh, stocks, uh, there's also a charting tool that's available on that website. All right. And uh, one of the things that the, the second phase that we're going to have is also a REITs um, uh, analytical tool. All right, so it's going to go really in depth. So if you're really interested in the REITs market, um, you know, stay tuned. Uh, we're going to launch this in a second phase, hopefully by the next one or two months. All right. And further information, if you want to join um, uh, again to also get connected to SGX, join SGX himself on uh, on Facebook. So just go to uh, go to Facebook and search for SGX, and you can also download the SGX mobile application on the App Store and also Google Play. Uh, this is also where you get, uh, you know, market data, news, and company announcements uh, in uh, for Singapore listed companies. All right. So there are more resources that's coming in um, today. Uh, yeah, you know, um, Mike has also shared as uh, investors uh, IO was it? Uh, investor IO, SG investor IO, SG investors IO. That's where you can get uh, a, a compiled uh, research reports uh, on all SGX companies. Right. Okay. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Um, you know, uh, thank you, Mike. As always, uh, it's been uh, it's been uh, enlightening. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we hope to see you again in our next webinar. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Okay. So have a good evening, everyone, and um, we'll see you again in our next uh, session. Thank you. Yeah. Stay safe.